Good morning, everybody. Kirk Spano, Fundamental Trends and Margin of Safety Investing and Investment Letters. Um, going to cover some options today and take a look at some charts. And what we're going to discover is that there's a lot of potential double taps going on right now. And what we should take away from that is either we should continue to be sellers, not buyers, uh, just constantly trimming week after week. And that if you want to sell some covered calls, that is definitely out there as well. It is hard to know if this market is going to have a small correction or a big correction. Um, the macro Monday piece is late. I worked on it until the wee hours last night, um, on and off all day. Have some great charts, included a couple of uh, YouTubes in there to um, help you uh, add some levity and, and some understanding to what's going on, I think. So look for the Macro Monday to be up on Tuesday later on today, um, before the end of the workday, so folks can read it at night. The other piece that's due right now that I'm going to include with this video is option selling. And if we want to find stocks to um, sell covered calls on, I would highly recommend that you subscribe to Bar Chart for $29 a month. The options trades that you get out of Bar Chart will pay for your membership a thousand times over, literally a thousand times over. Um, I wish I had a discount code for you, but they're already pretty cheap. So they don't feel like they want to cut me in for uh, two bucks. So I'm telling you to probably subscribe to Bar Chart anyway. If you have any intentions of selling covered calls or cash secured puts, because this is the best screener I've ever found. So um, what we have here is a way to set up your screening based on your lists. So I have two lists, one VSL, which probably is missing a few stocks, and then cash secured puts list, which is um, many of the VSL stocks, uh, but companies that I'm looking to sell cash secured puts on. So this first screener is for cover calls, monthly expirations, two to three months out. And we could certainly go further out uh, if we wanted to, uh, because I think that um, about six months is a pretty good time frame right now. July, August, September, October, November. So about five months is a really good time frame. So we're gonna look from two to five months on our expirations, um, stocks. We can add the ETFs in there too. Um, we want some volume, some open interest. Um, make that even in the money. And bid price greater than 50 cents. So let's see here, we're looking for cover calls. All right, so that's how we'll start. Now we are going to save this screen. I know there's a way to do it. Now we'll just take a look at the results. I think I do that first. Um, it's going to give us a whole bunch of options, cover calls that we could sell. And I'll just put them uh, in order of implied volatility. I already had that done. Implied volatility uh, is the estimated volatility of the underlying stock over the period of the option. And I wanna talk about implied volatility. The higher the volatility, the higher the premiums that you'll receive but also the higher the risk that you're taking. So we take a look at Delta Airlines here, and it's currently at about $29 a share. 
and they're saying go ahead and sell the 33 or 30 dollar uh, strike price covered calls and you're going to get three or four dollars for those now i think uh, that the market is stretched as it is so i would probably sell closer to the money presuming i want to hold on to this right with such a high implied volatility you could very easily be a seller of the stock altogether uh, anytime the implied volatility is over about 50 percent for sure um but really over about 30 33 percent being a seller of the stock outright is not a horrible idea. But over 50%, uh, it's got to cross your mind that you would want to just sell the stock outright. And um, that means that there's a very good chance that the volatility is going to work against you rather than for you. So this is probably where I'd sell that. But let's take a look at a chart, a delta first. I may or may not have pre-built at this point. Not really. I have a I have something in there. All right, I have a couple fib lines in there. All right. So Delta had the big, you know, send down. What am I tracking here? Oh, 200 week uh, moving it. So I've put in recently the 200 week moving average, which is what you would expect it to gravitate to from either direction. So right now it just had this massive bear trend and then it popped back up. So probably the place to have sold the covered calls was up in here if you owned it, right? As soon as it crossed this Fibonacci level, you should have been looking at selling covered calls. Um, my contention with all the airlines, even Delta, which is the one that I like the best, it's really the only one I like, um, is that these stocks all probably get back to their lows again uh, as travel comes back extremely slowly. Uh, the caveat for anything that I say that's bearish is, but if we really do get an economic recovery that's faster and stronger than expected, due to a vaccine or people just don't give a shit about getting sick, um, you know, then maybe these stocks go higher. Uh, the other thing that could happen, and I'm talking about this in the uh, Macro Monday piece that will be out on Tuesday, um, is the Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve is printing a lot of money. So I spent some time in the Macro Monday piece talking about the Federal Reserve. I also hit on um, Reddit and Robinhood, um, Morgan Stanley, and really three big factors that I think are important in the market right now, which is the Federal Reserve printing a ton of money, um, the perception that the economy and the coronavirus will get better rapidly, uh, and then third is what we are seeing for the very first time is the millennials truly driving the market. And in a low volume environment where the rich are sitting out, uh, for the most part, the rich are sitting out, um, the millennials have the firepower to um, keep this market floating. Uh, it hasn't done so well lately, um, but it hasn't done so poorly either. So you take a look at Delta. And I think the question you have to ask is, do I think it's going to go down in this area or do I think it's going to chop along? If I think it's going to chop along, I sell the 30 or the $33 covered call and I probably go out a little further um, than, well, that's uh, September. I'd be pretty cool with September, I think. Um, but you can always take a look up here. Um, you, this is just a... Uh, Ameritrade stuff. And we could take a look at the, I don't want to go past the election. And I need to, so 
to all. There we go. What covered calls look interesting? So people have been using bar charts or something, but look at the premiums on this. This one's come down. These have all come down in premium. And that's really primarily a function of the price of the security moving. Um, but this one's holding steady. So you might even want to take a look at this. And you just have to do your math and divide, okay, how much am I earning if I sell this versus what am I earning if I sell that? And what level of risk do I want to take? You know, stock is at about 29 and change right now. Do I want to get max income without going into the money? Another thing you could do is if you're fairly certain that this stock is going to fall, sell an in the money covered call to about the point where you think it's going to go. So if we think that it's going to 25, take a look at the $25 covered call, sell it for $6.70. That is like getting $31.70 right now, even though it's trading at 29. And if it falls, it gets put to you at 25 and your net cost ends up being in the teens. So selling these in the money covered calls on stocks that, hey, I don't really want to sell it, but I think it's going to be choppy or I think it's even going to be negative for the next several months uh, or through the end of the year. This is a good way to squeeze out extra income. And if things go against you, you get a really good uh, uh, call away here. So, you know, the opposite would be selling the, the put. So you could do both. You could, and I think I misstated a few seconds ago. If you sold your cover call, you're getting 3170, right? 25 plus 670. Um, if you sold the 23, you're only getting 31. Um, where, this, where selling in the money really helps you is if you really think it's gonna drop in price and you just can't bring yourself to sell it for tax reasons or love reasons or whatever reasons you got. Uh, I, I, I don't think I've done this but two or three times in my career in 25 years, but I wanna throw it out there. Um, what I do think that you could do though is write this $30 covered call, take your $4 and if it drops, you know, then you're just waiting for it to come back, but you got $4 in your pocket. So these covered calls are, I think, a pretty good way to um, get rid of some of your risk uh, if you're only neutral or even short-term negative on a stock, but you don't want to sell it. You go up here at 33 if you want to give yourself some growth room, right? So you have about 10% growth plus about a 10% premium. That's pretty good, 20% through September. I think I could live with that. So that's how you should think about looking at these covered calls. On the flip side is if you think it's going down to 25, probably sell about a $27 put. Get your three and a half bucks, get your net price under 25, you can even sell the 28s, you can sell the 29s, but the higher your strike price on selling a put, the more likely it is to be put to you, correct? So some of the other stocks, I'll take a look at Roku. Roku, they're saying sell the $130 strike. Now, super high implied volatility, not a rebound play like Delta, right? Delta is a rebound play. So you have to think to yourself, time it takes to rebound and are they already pretty darn close to low? With Roku, not the same story. Roku's had a hell of a rally. Came back, triple topping right now. What do we know about triple tops and triple bottoms? Usually they break. 
pretty hard in one direction or the other. I would suggest that Roku in the short term is more likely to head towards 105, right about where it stopped, right? I mean, I, I had this price as where to look to buy, and had you bought at this yellow line, you'd have made a pretty good gain pretty quick. So if you're swing trading, you know, pay attention to this stuff because I've got this color coded for you and we're hitting these over and over and over again. But I'm not gonna sit here and pound the table and yell at you to buy stuff. You need to follow along, and keep your charts and keep your lists that you check from time to time, right? This isn't about what can, all the work Kirk can do for me. This is how I can learn how to do some of this myself so that I don't miss ideas. I don't miss, right? Because I don't have 85 hours in a day. So this chart's made. You should have an alert set in your system that says, hey, at about 106 bucks a share, I want to look at Roku or just put an order in at 105, right in there. Had you done that, you would have gotten a heck of a rally. And now you'd be asking yourself, do I sell the stock or do I sell the cover to call? Now, in this case, I'd probably be doing both. I'd probably be selling covered calls on part of my position, you know, on about 1% uh, of my total holdings in my portfolio because um, this is probably a 2% position. And then I sell the rest. I take my profits. So these guys are saying $130 September. Get 19 ish dollars a share. Um, lowers your cost basis to about 111. So if you think it's going to be choppy, if you think the upside is limited from here, but, but, you know, you had that gain, right? If you had this gain from where we had it pegged to be a buy, right around 105, 106. Be basically be able to capture all of your gains. And if it rises anymore, it gets called away. And, you can, and you've locked in all your gains. So think of it as locking in your gains. That's why you don't sell covered calls right away when you buy something. The whole buy right strategy is bullshit, right? You don't buy a stock at 105 and then write the covered call at 110. If you're going to buy a stock, you buy it because you think it's going up. Then after it's gone up, you sell a covered call to the price level where you think it's going to do you the most good. Now, if you wanted to let it run a little bit, maybe write the 140 or the 145 or even the 150. But you always have to go back and consult your chart and say, okay, where do I think the top side is of the stock in the short run? I, I would say 140-ish is about the best I would expect. Um, although you could see a full retrace, an extension up to here. Get my colors right for you, there you go. the first time. Oops. All right. This is the one that's wrong. Remember? Longest one. Second. In general, I'm going to do two fibs on these charts. A very long one. And then an uh, shorter one. And the shorter one is really just for trading purposes. 
the longer one is kind of your primary count, right? Like an Elliott wave, they call it a primary count. Um, but really just the longer term trend. And the reason why we can use the longer term trend here is that the stock's not been around that long, right? So this is just all gobbledygooks, you know, gets pushed up. This correction back into this structure, right? And this structure tells you that, hey, you know, in the 70s, you probably ought to be buying the stock with reckless abandon. And if it gets into the 60s, even more, right? Then you take a look at this level here. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, that's where it peaked out here. And this is where it showed a breakout. So this FIB level, my guess is that the stock doesn't go under 80 again, unless they have some major business problems, right? So I'm looking at a range on Roku of about 80-ish, up to about 140-ish. And if things are more extreme, 60 ish to 150 ish. Think of it as a standard deviation, right? This first range is probably, you know, where it's going to be most of the time. Then it can, it can expand the range, right? Another deviation further out. So seeing as we're near the top of my expected range, I think you should be selling the stock or trimming the stock and selling covered calls. So you can go all the way down this. Do, does, do any of you own any of these? And we'll look at a chart if you do. SLV. Is SLV on here? So I have SLV in the watch list and they're not saying anything. Just do it this way. Oh yeah, SLV. So they're saying sell the 18th to October. And the reason why this is a good system it's because it's monitoring the price levels for you and the technical levels for you, right? It's not gonna be perfect, um, but it's, it's gonna give you a good heads up. So if you're keeping track of things the way you should, I mean, tell them, if, if you got a six or seven figure account and you're not willing to pay $29 to have it monitored like this for you, then you shouldn't be doing it yourself, right? Between TradingView and Stock Rover for screening for ideas and to, and to learn about financials and, and bar chart, I mean, if I give you a, a deal on all three of them, I would. So anyway, let's take a look at silver. Now, I haven't done much with silver. So let's do something with silver. When we do our Fibonacci retracement, oops, we don't want to accidentally just press the chart. We want to look at where are their major inflection points. All right, somebody type stop when I find a major inflection point. There you go, yay! <laughs> All right, so that's called a swing, just a spot, like a swing, a, swing a pivot. So this is the bottom after a long bear market. Then you find the most recent top, or pivot top. You could probably use either one of these, this one or this one. Um, let's use this one. Uh, 
was was first. I'm not sure it matters. A lot of times it doesn't matter if they're similar to begin with. Then we wanna use what's called an extension. So we look for a recent pivot, a more recent pivot. Okay, so find, use the same line. Actually, we are gonna use this one over here. So we're gonna use this line all the way down to this bottom. Oh, we can't, I'm sorry. Bottom to bottom or top to top. We don't have a new top yet. So we'll go from this pivot low to this pivot high to this pivot low. It doesn't give us a real exciting range, does it? All right. So with silver, looks to me, probably would want to be a buyer about here, right? Probably a buyer about here. That should be the red line. Where's my red line? All right, so we had that one about right. green line. Does anybody think we're going to see that price again? I want somebody to say never. As soon as I hear never, that means when. So I think that you can buy silver down here around 15, but you're at a pretty significant resistance area here. And yeah, it could continue to here. And there is clearly the potential for a breakout. Um, but again, I'm not terribly bullish through the end of this year from here on out. You know, we're almost at the uh, top area that I talked about uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. So I'd probably be selling those $18 cover calls I think those are probably really good ones to do, right? You get a buck, give or take. You could dial it down to 17 if you want, but I do the 18s. That's a little bit outside of the, the range of expected. So it gives you plenty of cushion to let it run a little bit. Uh, collect your dollar. It's pretty good, you know, pretty good premium. And since we're bullish on silver longer term, right? You know, we could see silver um, much higher someday, right? Let's, so let's, let's take another Fibonacci level. Do you really think this is reasonable? No, so we don't use it. But we have this huge plunge here, then rally back to here. I think this is a reasonable level to work from. So let's do a longer term Fib retracement from here all the way back. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to adjust this so I can see it better. All the way back to that line. change this. This is your blue lines, right? Second one. Green is longest term that we're using. Blue is the next. Let's 
use one year to make it easier to look at. It's all about making it easy. So here, look, pretty strong resistance in this area, right? Now that we add the longer Fibonacci, pretty strong resistance. So now if it breaks out, it's gonna go and go, right? But I think this looks like pretty strong resistance in the face of monumental economic hurdles for the next year or so. Like I said, everything is, vaccine dependent. So I would sell those covered calls. You know, the whole relationship between gold and silver, I think is, is way overstated. I think the historical correlations are not there. Um, gold is about, has always been about preservation of value, right? It's something that people covet. It's a jewelry, um, has some industrial uses now uh, because of cell phones um, and, you know, central banks and countries still hoard it. So unless all the central banks and countries decide to dump their gold on the market, right, it's going to hold its value. Um, silver, on the other hand, while it's pretty and has its uses in, um, jewelry, uh, it's primarily become a industrial metal. So I would follow the industrial aspects of silver more than anything else. Um, one other thing to know, and this is just sort of like where there's natural ga gas flaring, uh, when you have oil drilling, when you dig for gold, most of the time you find silver. So there is residual silver production um, that's not built right into a lot of expectations. So I, I, don't, I don't really think that the whole ah, silver is behind gold on the historical ratio thingamajiggy, I just don't think it's that important. You know, when it gets to blowout levels, sure, maybe. Um, but remember, gold, gold plunged too here. So the whole gold is leading or gold is trailing or silver is trailing or leading. Eh, I don't think it matters. Silver is more connected to the industrial markets. Gold is more connected to the financial markets. And sometimes the financial markets and the industrial markets are different. You know, right now the financial markets uh, with all the money printing would dictate that gold leads. It's that simple. Um, Will silver catch up when, when industry starts getting better and people have less fear and, you know, presumably government prints less money? Yeah, then it'll narrow, but tell me when that is. Is that now or is that six months or a year or a year and a half from now? So I would just look at the ranges and say, okay, this is probably about as good as it gets. Sell a 17 or $18 covered call. Um, I think you even sell the 17 because uh, I think the asthma breakout are that slim because the industry is just not going to get good that fast. So, all right. Yeah, yeah they didn't put GLD in here. Oh, yeah, there's, there, there's GLD. 190. They're, and they're selling, and they're, okay, well, here they go. They're, they're saying you can sell at the money on GLD because of the way the implied volatility is laying out. So let's take a look at GLD then. Mm. Oops, wrong one. So we've done some work on this one. Aren't things breaking out? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start putting the green line near the bottom just so we have more room to work with. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, gold could be breaking out right here. And it could rally to 175-ish pretty quick, 184-ish pretty quick. Do I think it will? Don't know. But what I do know is that it's just still too expensive for me. Like I said, I, I buy it in the low 150s. I told everybody, you know, go ahead and sell uh, cash secured puts when it was back in here, right? When it was bouncing off this line, I said two or three times, I don't think it's a bad idea to sell cash secured puts so you get a net buy price in this range. I don't think gold falls into here for quite a while. It could happen. Um, <clears throat> it happens just have to be a pretty severe correction. Um, and I think this is the box that you really were shooting for. And if you feel like you missed it and it's gonna break out, uh, just remember this, the gold stocks will do even better when this goes up. So if this goes from here to here, so you're better off owning GDX because the gold stocks will do better. Because the gold stocks are dropping all that, that's 100% that's profit for, for the gold stocks versus, you know, 7% move for gold. Huge leverage in the gold stocks. So I'm just not super excited about GLD. I know that some of you like to talk about it. And again, I would just tell you, if you really like gold and you want to think of it as a long-term store of value that's really cool, um, I'll look at Barrick too and, and, and Newmont. Um, go and buy some of the one ounce gold bars and buy some cool gold coins, you know, Cougarans or something. Um, you know, I just, I just think that's the way to have long-term gold. But here, this is trading and, you know, this is probably where you wanted to buy it. And this is probably where you want to write cover calls or, or trim, unless you're convinced that it's going to shoot up here but if you're convinced it's really going to 3,000, buy physical gold. Buy gold bars, right? Those little one ounce gold bars are super cool. You know, if you can afford it, buy a, buy, buy a real gold bar. I have no idea what that would cost. Um, they may know how many ounces in a, in a regular gold bar. Are they kill a, they're measured in kilograms, aren't they? The, the gold bars that you see like at Fort Knox, that sort of stuff. How much do those weigh? I don't remember. I, I know there's a number. But in any case, I think that writing covered calls on GLD here to about 175 or 184, um, and they're saying the 190s. I don't know. I, uh, I think if you wrote the 170 and took your 729, that gets you a 177, 929, that's pretty good. You know, for buying it at whatever it is right now, 166. And it's just, think about it in percentage terms, just not a sexy trade. All right, so you wanna take a look at Barrick. Again, Barrick, not my favorite because it's not in the S&P 500. Um, five-year chart. All right, let's go further back. Who is that? I put that in there? How did I put that in there? What is it? Uh, those, are, those are lines that I put in a long time ago before I had a system in place. So let's take those. Well, let's just turn it green. Turn that into the Armageddon line. Turn that into the bottom fishing line. Somebody take a look at the VSL. Do I have Barrick on there? I believe I do. What is our bottom fishing price on here? Keep it to yourself for a second. Let's see if I come up with the same answer again. So this is a major pivot, pivot, right? And there you go, bam. Uh, 
Let me drag it down. Oh, you're not letting me drag it down. How come? There we go. There we go. All right. So now let's take a, an extension. Top, bottom, top. No, bottom, top, bottom. So look at that. Look at that correction went right to the 0.618 retracement. To there. And then a bottom down here. Come on, match up. There we go, that's pretty close. Is that about right? There you go. Again, we show these Fibonacci lines because over and over and over again, they play out. So, Pretty close. I would probably drop this line down to here. Oh. I drop that down to see where those two levels come up that one and that one. Let's make that a little easier to look at. There we go, right? A little easier to look at. So about Is this the right symbol? What the hell? That's not what I wanted. So whatever the heck we were just charting here, <laughs> there you go, whatever this is. <laughs> yeah, now we have one, there you go. All right, so let's actually look at Barrick. There you go, that's much easier. Major pivot points. Start with this one. And then let's do the next one right away. This one might be more important. Change the color, make it blue, one, two. And let's take a look at an extension. And top to bottom to top. Again, bottom to top to bottom. Enough of it. If you think you're in a bearish, if you think you're a bull, um, that's interesting. Look where it bottomed right at a fib level here. All right, there we go. So take a look at this jitterbugging right at a 0.618 level. Why? 
I don't know why either. It just happens. It's reinforcing. It's natural, and then it's reinforcing because people pay attention to it. All right. So. Thirties and twenty fives, they're saying. What does the chart say? Chart says a thirty dollar um, cover call would be pretty nifty right there, right? If you want to give yourself a little room to run, sell the thirty. And if you think it's gonna turn down from this point six one eight level, which would not be uncommon, right? If you feel more like taking income now and containing risk, sell the lower cover call for a higher premium. If you wanna take a little bit more risk and let your stock run a little bit more and just take a little premium, then sell the 30. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, right? So it depends on what your risk level is. Do you wanna sell the 25? I'm gonna sell a 30. I would probably sell the 30 just because I think that the general trend for gold is positive. But to get through here and then rally even more, this would be a mega rally, right? And I think it's gonna happen someday. Um, I just don't know if that day is this year. So let's take a look at Newmont, which has been the top performing stock in the S&P 500. Right? So it looks like these are all in there. And it jitterbugged right at a double line, right? Confluence. When multiple Fibonacci levels are, are on top of each other, stacked, it's called confluence. And that's what I look for a lot of times, is where do, where are there multiple Fib levels? Right? We could actually erase a lot of these and just keep the ones that are piled up. So I think with Newmont, you know, did they, uh, they did not throw Newmont in here. Uh, almost positive it's on my list. It's not. It's already on the list. I mean, this is a big list, so I, I can't imagine I missed any. Is it not in alphabetical order? Ah, there we go. Sure it is. Okay. So their call, cover call thing didn't uh, call out this, call this out. Why? No. I'm going to bring this. Uh, that's not what I want to do. I'm just trying to lower the whole chart. I mean, this stack could break out to 72. Again, I don't know if it's going to do it soon. But if the market tests highs and there's more money printing, it could go all the way to 72. Um, my covered calls are already at 60. So I would love to see this pull back. And yeah, I'll be honest, I'm not positive it'll get down below this level here. I mean, I. I almost think that. I want to get very involved. It gets to the low 50s again. Because I just don't think it breaks through this area so much. I don't even know if we need that there. I mean, I think that's your buy area from about 52 to 47 if it gets back there. And it should, I mean, look at the way this popped, jitterbug, came down, traded, and then it broke out. That's a pretty big gap. So I can see it coming back here. 
I just don't know if it goes ding, 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 all the way down in here. I, I mean, I, I'd be very curious to me if it did that. In fact, I would have a hard time I would have a hard time not buying it right there. So I'm going to raise the bottom fishing to 46. Right, this is the range, that's the box. Just understand that, I mean, there's, there's more down there, but this seems to be a more playable area. And like you said, if you just want to take money off the table short term to let it consolidate in here, which is a very good possibility it consolidates, you know, go ahead and sell us a covered call. A 65 maybe, a 62, 64, 68, I don't know, somewhere in there that makes sense for your equation. Yeah. So at 56, he sold the $60 cover calls based on this. Yeah, and that might be a pretty, I mean, that's what I did. I mean, I sold them before you did though, so I didn't get as much premium. But I mean, this is, nah, right? It makes a lot of sense. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna fly through some things. You know, I've been reading Sentiment Trader and you know, there's smart money, dumb money thing. You know, is this, is the dumb money turning over now too? That would be interesting to me if everybody became a seller, right? What if all these millennials starting to go back to work, starting to get COVID themselves? Average age of a COVID case in Florida is 37. Um, what if everybody starts selling for a little while? Forex Analytics, uh, Dale Pinkert said today might be the top in the market. He said that a week ago, today. He, spe he specifically pointed to today. Be curious to me if that happened. You know, you, I, I suggested that it gets back up into this box at 319, 320 level. Uh, but you know, it's having a hard time making those last couple points. So we'll see, we'll see. But it does look like a big head and shoulders formation. I mean, it really does. As long as the shoulders are lower than the head, which it has, I mean, this needs to break up here to invalidate the bearish uh, scenario. I don't know if we break the 200, I mean, break the big trend line. This area down in the 260s to 280, right? 260 to 280. I think that's a given. I just don't know when. I can tell you what's going to happen. I can't tell you when. Uh, weird things are happening with uh, safe havens and, and risk assets. <laughs> They're both going up. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Analysts, and this is what I think you should be most afraid of. The analysts were so wrong that they're adjusting all their price targets up. Now you don't see me change um, my bottom fishing too often, right? Now I've been adjusting certain things that I really like up a little bit, um, but I've been doing that for months. Um, I'm not changing my bottom fishing on many things because remember a year ago or so, and everybody said your bottom fishing are too low, they'll never get hit. Go take a look at the VSL. Around half of them got hit and the rest were pretty close. So things happen suddenly and you know we'll see if the next correction is as deep and if it rebounds quite as well. Uh, hard to know. What's the Fed going to do after the election? What's the Fed going to do next month? Who knows? Um, I don't think you're going to get a plan out of Congress um, potentially until after Labor Day, but we'll see. Um, 
Pelosi wants certain things and the Republicans don't want to give in on extending the unemployment benefits and they don't want to give money to the states and they don't want to give more money to the hospitals. So we'll see. Um, Trump wants infrastructure and payroll tax cut. I will say a payroll tax cut on the employer side makes some sense, right? Because it, it makes it a little easier for them to keep some employees. Um, the way I would do it is I would turn it into a direct tax credit, but I understand that they need the money now. So, you know, but I think there's a way to structure a tax credit for business to keep employees. But, you know, there has to be strings attached. Typically, the Republicans don't want any strings on corporations. They just want to give them breaks and let them do what they want to do. I think there has to be strings attached tied to employment. Um, some of these other things that are going on, though, are, are weird. Um, is the economy really improving better than expected? No, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I just think that you have such a low number that you, we started from a couple of months ago that it's going to take some time to recover. And, and I cover that in today's article that should be out later. Uh, Three-ish or four-ish should be my guess. Um, but the Macro mon Monday, I go through the economic numbers recovering all that GDP and earnings and employment, there's just no way it happens by the end of the year. It's impossible, impossible. Now, could it happen by next summer? Maybe, maybe. I mean, I would bank on things starting to get significantly better next summer. Um, we'll see. Uh, but earnings without the buybacks, Earnings take a while and you're watching the airlines right now issue more shares and take on more debt. You know, it's tough, tough, tough to be super bullish. So these guys have um, different categories uh, of optimism and, you know, some of these scores are just off the charts. I can't believe um, what's going on in certain phases. So we will see what's going on with all these different sectors and different countries. But there's a pretty strong argument that we should get some money invested in foreign markets and some more money in commodities. Because in a year, we're gonna look back at some of these prices and go, gosh darn it. And some of these stocks that people are chasing I mean, somebody, I had, I've had several people who have never bought stocks before suddenly want to buy stocks. No, if you're a fund investor, you're still a fund investor, right? You don't just suddenly want to buy stocks because they went up in price. Um, if you want a basket of stocks, understand how to build it and what you're going to substitute it for. So have a lot of overbought's and oversolds. Um, I think that if, you, if you're not using right now as an opportunity to sell oil and gas investments, I don't know when you're ever, ever gonna do it, right? So, because they've rallied, right? Let's take a look at XOP just as a proxy. It's rallied all the way up to that level now it's starting to pull back. I'm telling you, I think come on, grab. Oh. I think XOP goes into the teens. Not sure where, but in the teens by the end of next year. So I just don't want to own oil right now. The glut's the biggest it's ever been. We already did the math, take three to five years to get rid of the glut if they underproduce on purpose. And who can afford to do that? And why on earth 
with Saudi Arabia, especially after the election? Why would Saudi Arabia um, help American oil anymore? So I, I just don't expect the cuts to last much longer. So you're getting the chance to sell all of your oil and gas investments. The only one I like is Kinder Morgan. I don't like any of the any of the oil pipelines, any of them, zero. Eventually they're gonna get screwed as oil companies go bankrupt. Right? They're gonna get screwed. Because even if private equity comes in and buys some of those oil assets, they're not gonna pay the same pipeline fees. They're gonna break the contracts through bankruptcy. So sell XOP if you got it, sell anything that's in XOP if you got it. The only oil company on the planet that I would consider owning right now is Total, and I wouldn't own Total right now. Off that rally, let it come back. Let it come back with the whole complex into the 30s again. Then if you really want an oil company because you just want exposure, because just in case, then you buy Total. It's the, I think probably the best oil company on the planet. I don't even know that it's debatable to be honest with you. I think they are the best oil company on the planet. They've got the cheapest assets. They don't have a lot of dead assets. Uh, they've expanded way faster than anybody else into alternatives and utilities and waste management. So I would uh, take a look at Total in this jitterbug area, middle 30s. All right, let's call it a day. And I will get the Macro Monday out on Tuesday this week. And yeah, I'll be working late tonight to get a lot of things done. I was almost caught up this weekend and I took a couple days off. So hung out with the Hulk and uh, took him swimming on Father's Day. Bought him a little, or his parents bought him a little raft. It was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think I'm uh, grandfathered out for a few days. He'll wear me out on Friday because we go for our long walks. Uh, somebody has a question about inverse ETFs. Unless you're a day trader, stay away from them. All right, have a good day and I'll catch you soon.